This What's Working with Cam Marston podcast is brought to you courtesy of Michelob Ultra Beer. They say consistency is the key to success. They weren't wrong. So how about grabbing a beer that's consistently smooth, consistently refreshing, and consistently light? You might just find that the road to success can be pretty enjoyable. Michelob Ultra, the perfect balance of taste and refreshment and only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Enjoy responsibly. Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Let's do this. Welcome to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is the radio show and podcast designed to bring you the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace trends shaping the state of Alabama. I try to find guests that will give us insights into the workplace, the workforce, or the marketplace trends in such a way that what they say to us, what they teach us, could make us a little bit better at whatever it is that we do. Welcome. I hope you enjoy the show. Our focus today is uh, the aging population. I don't know how else to say it. The aging population. I remember seeing a, a, a hockey stick type oriented chart that was sent to me that I use in some of my presentations that show how rapidly the senior members of our population are increasing. And what it essentially means is people are living longer, longer than these people had anticipated or longer than these families had anticipated. And one of the things that compounds the the implications of this is that people are having children later, meaning I and many people like me listening, and I know this is in my friend group, are having children at older ages and our parents are living longer, meaning that we are often stuck between caring for much younger children and much older parents. And oftentimes, it's the parents that get the short end of the stick. And that's just the reality of the situation. I'm My obligation is to care for my children and when I can care for my parents. And that's not being, being bad or mean or rude. It's just the way that the world works. People are living longer. And in many circles, it's called the sandwich generation. As in, I am being sandwiched between the need to care for my children and the need to care for my aging parents. And I know Many of you can relate. Again, my friend group is going through this quite a bit. All of us seem to have something somewhat akin to this going on. I'm going to tell this story as I get my guest in the studio here in a moment of my aging mother. As I record this, she was passed away about six months ago. Her illness began showing up, I'm guessing now, about three years ago, and it slowly began to take hold of her body that, so that she was unable to care for herself. My father stepped up in a remarkable way to care for my mother, and it was glorious to watch, but at times it was really taxing. No doubt about it, really taxing. And he began to wonder what his options were. What is he, what is he, what can, he, he's exhausted. What resources are available to him? What, what, what can he utilize in our community that may make things a little bit easier for him? He's very cost conscious, as any of us would be. It just wasn't a limitless pile of money to pull from. And through, just crazy irony here, through uh, our network, we learned that one of our friends, who we'd been friends with for a while, she was a colleague of my brother's, younger brother's, uh, would be able to help us. Her title is Geriatric Care Manager. Her name, Ellen Douglas Alvis. And we called on her and said, hey, we didn't realize you did this. And she came in and began to tell us what our options are were based on her evaluation of my mother and based of her knowledge of the marketplace of what could be done for her. And folks, I'm telling you, this is the type of service that if you don't know about, and we didn't, If you don't know about and you are in the position like my brothers, my father and I were in not too long ago of wondering what to do with a parent that needs more and more care, these geriatric care managers are out there and they are able to guide you. And when I sat with Ellen, my brothers, my father and I sat with Ellen and discussed the situation of my mother, I thought, I can't believe we didn't know that a service like this is available. 
uh, other people need to know about this. And I asked her a while ago, Ellen, you need to come on this radio show and tell people what you do. Ellen Douglas, as her name is, you need to come on the radio show and tell people what it is that you do. And after a lot of arm twisting, I finally get her into the studio today. She is, again, a geriatric care manager. And in an aging population, her expertise and her empathy and her compassion is something that I suspect many of us are going to want to know about. Ellen Douglas Alvis is a geriatric care manager. When we come back from break, she's going to tell us a little bit about what it is that they do and how they provide value in a society with an incredibly rapidly aging population. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. When we come back, Ellen Douglas Alvis and me talk geriatric care management. Do you have an industrial or commercial construction project you're ready to make a reality? Person Services Corp. is a diverse specialty contractor capable of tackling complex projects. They've won awards from Engineering News Record and the Association of General Contractors. If you're looking for a turnkey project management solution, advanced technologies, and skilled personnel you can trust, look no further than Persons Services Corp. Find out more at PersonsServices.com. We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. About six months ago, my mother passed away. And prior to that, my family had some difficult times making decisions about what to do with her as her disease got worse and worse. We happened to find, well, it's a long story, but into our house, literally one afternoon, came Ellen Douglas Alvis. She was incredibly important to the decisions our family made. We were in an emotional state trying to care best we could for my mother. And she very caringly, very lovingly, very patiently, and very practically laid out the options for what we had. Her title is a geriatric care manager. Her bio reads that she's a master's level social worker, a licensed graduate social worker, a certified care manager, and a member of the Aging Life Care Association. The counsel that she gave my family that afternoon was uh, incredible and will never be forgotten. It was truly something wonderful to watch. I've asked her for 18 months to get on the show and talk about what it is that she does because I know many of you, like me, are going to need her expertise or someone like her expertise somewhere across the state of Alabama someday. So, Ellen, after 18 months of begging and pleading, welcome to What's Working. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. You were really instrumental to our family that day, and I'll never forget it. I mean that sincerely. Tell us what a geriatric care manager is and what you do. Okay, so a geriatric care manager is any type of healthcare professional that's a nurse or a social worker like myself, um, and they focus mainly on the senior uh, the, and their family, the aging uh, population, and also those with disabilities. Um, so it, it does encompass it, both of uh, those areas. And basically, I am like a liaison, an advisor, a resource finder for families who are dealing with an aging loved one when they just don't know where to turn, what to do. Um, They may have situations where there's lots of siblings and no one can quite get on the same page. And so I can act as, you know, the person that is unemotional. It's they're not attached emotionally like you would be if it's your own mother or father, and so I can provide that sense of um, you know ability to to think more clearly um, in those situations. You were you advocated for my mother. You advocated yeah. for each of our interests in right. that day, and and we learned about you because you did something similar for my grandmother years before. So. Um, never thinking we'd need it for our own household. Suddenly my mother falls into this illness and you played a big role for us there. I'm curious of your story, though, Ellen Douglas. It seems as if you step into some grim situations. The, the, the conclusion is foretold 
almost when you come through the door uh, of a family or, or, or an aged one. What made you want to do this? There's so many life-giving situations, yet you're in one of the end-of-life environments providing an incredible service. But what made you? What's your story? Yeah, so um, it's funny you ask because as a as a child, I always enjoyed being with adults. Um, I loved I, funny story too that um, I would always tell my mom when her sisters would come to town I'd say let's go in the living room and talk like ladies and I just <laughs> love to hear the gossip so you know I knew the older adults always had the story always knew what was going on um, and so as a child I would walk down the street to a neighbor's house and they were elderly um, and they provided so many amazing stories and fun times and interesting foods um, that you know that they would introduce to me that I didn't know as a child and so um, it's I just really enjoyed being with someone who was older than me. Um, and, you know, yes, it's a lot of difficult situations, a lot of um, lifetime of issues that have come to to together when you go into a family and it's very sensitive but you meet some of the most amazing people and they bring so much to the table that I learn from them and yes uh, death is part of it but it is part of life and it is you know it's just amazing to watch someone who is in a bad situation who is very ill or not thriving at home and then you get them into a good care plan and you watch them thrive and really live those last few years to the fullest. I didn't know that a geriatric care manager existed until we found you. We've we've known each other, but I didn't know what you did. And suddenly you were an extraordinary resource to our household. But I was I was shocked by the number of decisions that needed to be made in these final years for both my grandmother, which I wasn't really involved with. I was aware of, but not involved with, but much more so involved with my mother the different options of types of care, the different ways that you can find funding for this through federal, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, Medicare programs, Medicaid programs, et cetera, stuff that I still don't quite remember from, I, I learned it and then haven't uh, uh, captured it again. What is the, the services that you offer? If you could uh, list the different services that you offer for your clients. Okay, so uh, definitely the number one thing is finding resources in the community, um, and then also doing placements to retirement communities, nursing homes, also finding services like home health agencies, hospice, sitter agencies, and then also sometimes creating a plan that just lays out what the needs are and how we're going to execute it. A lot of times I meet with clients and it's a one-time deal. The family just needs a plan and then we can, and then they execute it and it's it's a done deal and they do great. Um, sometimes I can come in and assess the home and see what modifications. Do we need grab bars? Do we need to change the layout of the bathroom? Do we need to widen doors? Or no, this everything is perfect in the home. Or the home is really not a safe place. Let's think of something different. Yeah, so you're able to look at the patient. Do we call them the patient or the client? Client, you yeah. You look at the client, you evaluate the client, mm -hmm. you spend time, you check their their ability, their mobility, let's say, I'm trying to. Absolutely. And uh, their cognitive capabilities and mm -hmm. things of that nature. And then you're able to look at the house mm -hmm. and determine whether the house is suitable based on what you've just, the interaction you've had. Right. But you also were able to list for us the different options of facilities around town. And even if I recall correctly, they're vacancies, and you, you must keep up with that stuff. Is that accurate? That's it. That's very accurate, yes. You know, you really have to keep up with um, – I have to get to know the – folks that work at the nursing homes and the assisted livings and retirement communities. Um, you need to know because things change. Um, and particularly during COVID, things really changed. And we had to know what the occupancy was, what the vacancies were. Would they allow someone to come in? Could families tour? A lot of places would allow me to come in and, and get information, but then they wouldn't let lots of family come in to get the information. So I did um, do that a lot. Care plan meetings, I would go in if the family would have to be on the telephone. So, um, yes, and also with hospitals, you know, what um, – Talking about the hospitals, you, you've got the discharge planners, and I can be an advocate and a 
liaison between them and the families as well. So what is the status of the family who needs you? Or is it that they're they're out of wits? They don't know what else to do. Is it they uh, they're uh, they're too emotional to make a logical decision when they call you? What is usually their state? So it's a wide variety. A lot of times it's because the family does not live locally. Um, I have many of my clients that their family lives out of state. And so it's like I cannot care for my loved one this far away. I cannot get on a plane every time there's an issue. Um, it's, it's you know physically impossible, financially difficult. Um, so a lot of my clients or that way. Um, I do have some that don't have children. They just have maybe a niece or a nephew. And it's not a very close relationship. It's not like a mother, daughter, mother, um, son, father. And I have some that don't have any family that they have maybe an attorney or a financial planner. And it's just been that way all their life. Um, And then some I have, they're just, we, we don't know what to do. We have done everything, and mom is still not thriving. She's not safe. She won't, you know, let us help her. What do we do? So, yes. Is it a relief when they see you coming, or is there some resentment? And I guess that you could say it's both. It's everything. It depends. But what is the sense when you come through the door? I know, and we've talked about this already today, it was a relief when, when we found you. What is what is, is that typical? Um, yes, it, it is. Uh, a lot of times the client themselves can be a little bit closed because it's like you're going to put me away Um, and that is not my goal ever Uh, least restrictive environment is my goal and making things as comfortable and is making the client is very uh, a part of the plan i'm in the studio today with ellen douglas alvis she's been very important to me and my family And um, we're going to come back after the break. And I want to learn, Ellen Douglas, what is the biggest surprise that your clients uh, are experience when you come to work with them? Their wow moment. And I can tell you what ours was when when you sat in our living room with our family and our mother and her situation. But I want to hear. I think there's a, a lot to be gained by learning what people are surprised about the most by what you offer. And we'll discuss that when we come back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Kim Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. This is Bill Wasden, Labor and Employment Attorney at Burr & Foreman. With offices across Alabama, our attorneys are keenly aware of employment situations in a state with under 3% unemployment. Employers have faced many obstacles over the last two years and new processes and policies must be in place to ensure you're setting clear expectations for your employees. We've created a list of the top five legal and operating issues facing employers in 2022 that will, ultimately, ensure your company is prepared for a data breach, the great resignation, new presidential executive orders, or potential overtime rule changes. Reach out to me at bwasden at burr.com, that's B-U-R-R dot com, or my partner, Katie Willis, kwillis at burr.com, for this information. Burr attorneys are here to help you with your labor and employment law needs. No representation is made that the quality of the legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers. We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Kim Marston, brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. Ellen Douglas, I was looking at, I used to show charts to my clients about the rapidly aging population. It was almost a reverse hockey stick, if you can imagine that, (laughs) that the people are, the, the lifespans are increasing rapidly. The technologies that we've created, the medicines, all that kind of stuff are keeping people alive longer than they had ever anticipated. And uh, they're getting to a stage of life that they don't know what they're going to do. Their family doesn't know what they're going to do. Prior to the break, I asked you, what is the biggest surprise that people experience when they engage you? What what would you say the answer to that is? That's a strange question, but I'm very curious what your thoughts are. Um, hmm, Biggest surprise, I I guess. Maybe the success that we have in getting a loved one to to do what the plan is. Um, for example, uh, I'll give you a story. One 
the the hardest things that I worked on in my career um, was I had a, a lady that um, had dementia and it was pretty progressed um, and she lived all alone and she had no one in Mobile living locally. She had a great niece and great nephew living out of state and it was a bad situation. She was just, uh, she had some caregivers, but it was hit or miss. And um, we really needed to get her out of the home and into a loving, caring uh, community, like a memory care assisted living. And it took a long time. It took months to convince her and to get her to to trust me because of the dementia. And we finally did. And her, she made so much improvements with her health. Her dementia got better. She was eating properly. She was taking her medications properly. It, it was um, it was very cool to see. And her great niece and great nephew were able just to come fly in and have a visit. And then go home knowing that she was cared for. So that's that's a big wow. Are many of your clients expecting a long term relationship with you and the, let's say the families or the the the, the organizer of the caregiving? It, mm-hmm. You mentioned it was a, it could be a financial planner, it could be mm-hmm. an attorney. So right. are they expecting a long term relationship with you and your client? Is that the way they kind of think it's going to play out? A lot of times, yes. I mean, sometimes it just it's it's a we get things done, a few visits. But most of my clients, I visit them on a weekly basis, maybe monthly, depending on their needs. But yes, I mean, I do things from like going to the doctor's appointments with the client to shopping at Dillard's for them. You know, it's it's the a wide variety of things that I do. And so, yes, a relationship is it goes deep. I mean, I, I actually had a, my, my very first client passed away last summer and we had been together as long as my agency had been in existence and so and I had a very close relationship with her financial planner and um and he depended on me and um and and I depended on him for her to understand her finances and and all that so yes a lot of my clients I have a long-term relationship so it's not a we're going to sit down we're going to do a a physical fitness test if you will we're going to evaluate the home and then I'm on to my next thing I'm going to send you an invoice and I'm on. Right. That's it, right. It's a it's a it's a months long depending it on is. the situation engagement there. Right. So there are probably people out there wondering how they know when your services are in need. Are there touch points that you can share that say if you're experiencing this, then I am someone that could help you out with this? What are those things? Yeah. So if you are finding yourself where you're concerned about your your parents or your loved ones that for their safety, um, maybe that they're not taking their medications properly, and and that's a safety issue. Um, maybe one of your parents. Have passed away, and you're, you know, the other, the other uh, spouse is, is left alone, and you're concerned about the loneliness. Um, you're concerned that now that dad is gone, we're seeing things in mom that we didn't see when he was still living, and so now we need to address them. Um, if you're noticing that mom is the primary caregiver of dad. Um, and she is experiencing things. You you need to to get some help. It doesn't need to all be on that one spouse um, because that is very difficult and typically the caregiver is the one that gets sick and something happens to them first um, because they're doing so much for that loved one so I would suggest that you would give a geriatric care manager a call then Um, and if you're also looking for resources and trying to figure out a new plan for your loved one um, you know a a geriatric care manager is a great person to contact something that I had heard but uh, didn't really experience until I saw it myself, was the toll taken on the primary caregiver. Now, I'm talking not talking about you. I'm thinking back right. to both my grandmother when she was ill. And my mother was the primary caregiver to her, and mom was exhausted taking care of her. And this is not a strike against my late grandmother. It was what's needed at the time. Correct. Then my mother became ill, and I was surprised at the toll taken on my father caring for my mother. This was, you know, I had heard said anecdotally, oh, you'll find that the caregiver is is it, it perhaps even overworked or more exhausted than the person he or she is caring for. Mm-hmm. And then I saw that myself and thought, gosh, they're right. Um, talk about that, if you will. It's one of the surprising parts, I guess, of getting old 
is the people that care for you struggle too. Absolutely, they do. And and I see it all the time. Um, you you go into a home and it's like the the let's just say it's the husband that's the primary caregiver and he is worn out because he's doing everything twenty four hours a day, seven days a week basically. Particularly if there's no assistance in the home. And it's not that it's the children are not helping, it's that it's just so taxing. And when you live day in and day out with someone who is struggling with their health, it is very grueling on your own, on your health and your physical being. Um, So yes, you definitely see that. And that's one of the areas you, you want a geriatric care manager can help relieve some of that because you want to be your wife's Husband, you don't want to be the caregiver all the time, and so a lot of times, um, you know, when you when you add in help, uh, help of caregiver of some sort, or make a move to an assisted living, let's just say, you know, sometimes that spouse can be the spouse again, and they can just visit and and be. Um, the the loved one that they are, as opposed to the constant care, the bathing, the dressing, the the meal preparing, all those things that are really are grueling and and taxing on on you. And it makes uh, it, it it at least in my own household, we saw a good bit of relief from my father. No strike against him when he started admitted he needed some help. Yeah, and you were very capable or you're convincing and saying, hey, you need some help here. This is not a one-man show anymore. It can't be a one-man show anymore. Mm -hmm. And you, your ability to care decreases without a break. You, you're, you're, you become less effective if you don't get yourself a break from time to time. That is right. And we, uh, we certainly saw that and my father was grateful for that. I'm, I'm curious. Do you is your caseload is that the right word? Are, are are you building clients again? The demographics would suggest that you should be very busy and yes. only busier, and more and more people should be entering the space based on the aging population. What is the volume of business that you've seen? I don't want your numbers; it's not right. my business. But <laughs> tell me what's tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, so um, definitely, it's it's definitely it, it ebbs and flows. Um, you know, the summertime seems to be a very busy time, and then as the holidays approach. It, it sort of declines. Uh, you know, no one wants to make any major decisions around the holidays, obviously. And then it picks back up after um, a family member comes into town and they see, oh, gosh, and mom or dad is really struggling and we really need to figure something else out. This is not we did not realize how poorly things were going. Um, And so then that's when I get a lot of calls. You know, COVID made things a lot different and difficult. uh, And you had to do things differently. I didn't get as many calls because everybody was just trying to figure it out. But definitely busy, because you had to do things differently. Mm -hmm. Um, So Yes, it is. It's definitely busy. And we're all continuing to age and and living a lot longer. Let's talk about when we come back from break, the differences in the different types of care that people can evaluate for their loved one, the different types of facilities that are available. Again, this was a world unknown to me until you introduced it to me. And I sat there thinking, how can I be 50 years old ish and not know this is all out there? And perhaps there's somebody out there that will be surprised at the different options that are available. I'm sitting here in the studio with Ellen Douglas Alvis. She is a geriatric care manager. She was very important to my family not too long ago. And as I've said a number of times and mean it sincerely, will be forever remembered as somebody that changed the, the course of the, the end of life for my mother. And it was a wonderful find that we had. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, University of Alabama. Person Services Corp. is a diverse specialty contractor that's changing how people think about general contractors. Person Services Corp. has experts in industrial and general construction, disaster recovery, infrastructure, and mechanical. They offer the latest in industry technology, turnkey project management services, and custom project solutions. Person Services Corp. has five offices across the Southeast to meet you anywhere your project demands. Find them at PersonsServices.com. Customer service never goes out of style. In fact, I think it's safe to say that customer service is more valuable and more important now more than ever. 
Hi, this is Cam Marston. One thing that my over 200 episodes of What's Working has taught me is how important customer service is to building and maintaining a thriving business. It's the growing need for customer service that's led me to partner with one of the state's leading customer service trainers to create our program called Delivering Five Star Customer Service. Your team will get one 90-minute training session per month for six consecutive months. Each session builds on the skills learned the previous month, allowing your customer-facing teams to practice before moving on to the next lesson. And the six lessons address everything from appearance to electronic communications to conflict resolution to maintaining a service mindset. Our program travels and is delivered in person at your workplace, nothing virtual. You simply can't practice the level of the skills this course teaches virtually. For more information, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's schedule a time to talk. Remember, you have less to fear from outside competition than you do from discourtesy and bad service from inside your own company. Again, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's talk about your business. We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed at the University of Alabama. In the studio today, Ellen Douglas Alvis is in front of me. She's uh, very important to my family, as I know you've heard a number of times. But prior to the break, Ellen Douglas, you and I were talking about uh, what are the facility availabilities out there. So we know that everybody would want to stay at home if possible. But when the decision is made that the home is not the right place, I was surprised to learn the number of options available to somebody. If you would go through the different things that uh, that is somebody in the that needs geriatric care, what their options may be depending on their situation. Sure, absolutely. Um, so just to add, uh, when I first moved to Mobile from from Birmingham, I did work in a retirement community that had several levels of care. So I do have that knowledge um, so of, of knowing the different levels of care and, and how the ins and outs will work in those uh, facilities. But first of all, retirement communities, independent living settings. And independent living is exactly what it sounds. You know, it's an apartment, villa type living, garden home, where there is 24-hour nursing care, um, there are meals provided, there's activities, socialization, um, and, and they're wonderful places to start the aging process because a lot of times you just don't want to live alone. Um, you want to meet new people and you want to have proper nutrition and, uh, and, and have that uh, flexibility of not doing yard work and um, just feeling safe. Then you move to assisted living and that's more uh, exactly what it sounds like. Assistance in, in your daily activities, uh, helping with bathing and dressing, uh, medication management, socialization again, proper meals, and then you move into uh, specialty care, assisted living, which is um, for dementia and Alzheimer's care. Uh, typically, they're a locked or a secure unit uh, where the doors are locked because you do have that occasional uh, dementia resident who can wander and you want to keep them safe and comfortable. And they have activities and programs that are g- catered and geared toward those residents who have dementia and who need that special um, loving care, that they need those special activities, things that give them purpose and to make them their day as uh, routine as possible. And they're, they're very uh, good facilities that can really um, make a, a person with dementia their life more enriched. And then you move to, to, to nursing home care. And that is, that is a higher le- highest level of care um, where you, are, you know, a lot of our, our nursing home patients are bed bound um, or they have a skill that needs to be addressed. And you have nurses 24 seven certified nursing aides. Um, you have a team. You have a social worker you have it's, it's a team approach you have physical therapy uh, you have dietetics uh, so it, it's a much higher level of care um, and then you have the end of life care hospice and that can be done in the home or there are so there is a, a facility here at, uh, in Mobile locally and, and and all over the state that that have some inpatient hospice type programs yeah and what I didn't realize what it is that it's it, it, seems, it sounds obvious but I didn't know it until you told us about it it's not for the patient to choose. 
the patient can say, I'd like to go into a retirement community or something like that. The garden home that you mentioned mm-hmm. a little while ago. But if they are not quali- if they don't have the, the the physical capabilities to do that, then they're not going to be accepted in there. It's not as if there's a space, so I want it. There's some qualifications that each of these patients, the clients, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. we call them yeah. clients. Uh, each of these clients have to kind of quote unquote pass mm-hmm. or not pass, as the case may be. And you evaluate that. You have mm-hmm. the ability to evaluate that and then make the res- uh, recommendation to the client's family or decision makers. Mm-hmm. Do you ever get do, do you do you find your clients ever get adversarial with your judgment of of what you think they need to do or are they mostly just delighted to get somebody that's going to help them? No, I definitely I, I get lots of not lots, but some pushback on no, I think that mom or dad can do that. And, and so the, the next layer is that the facility themselves provides an assessment. And so together, my assessment and, and the community or facility um, would provide that assessment and say, okay, we cannot meet your needs. Or yes, you, we can meet your needs. However, we would like for you to hire a sitter eight hours a day or we would like for you to be a part of our medication management program we feel like you can live an independent living but we need you to take your medication safely and let's just say they have a medication program or they have um, you know we don't feel like you're safe driving your vehicle on on campus so we offer transportation and then myself the family and the facility can work together to make a plan where we get involved in whatever they've suggested. So it is definitely a layer, layers upon layers of, of resources that help get someone to that point. Are you touring the facilities? Are people like you in the role across the state, do they tour the facilities regularly to yes. see what they look like? And, 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 and so that you can make a recommendation to your clients to say, oh, this is this facility and they have a beautiful, I'm making stuff up, atrium yeah. and, a, and a wonderful food menu and stuff like that. So you're Absolutely. constantly keeping up on what they're offering new. Yes, yeah, so you really have to, because when a family member asks you, what's the, you know, it, it's, what's the best place? What's this? What's that? Do they have that? You know, you, you do want to be knowledgeable on that. So, um, yes, it is. And I've had to go back and I'm having to go back now and revisit because for, for two years, I really, we couldn't do a lot of visiting. And so a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of the staff has changed new, new directors of nursing. And, um, so yes, you really kind of have to stay up on that. Um, pricing changes, um, staff changes. So yeah. You do. Do you take part in evaluating the medicines to say, hey, this patient, this client of mine, I'll get this right eventually, this client (laughs) of mine is taking these six different medicines. I'm not sure they need them or these two medicines may counteract one another. Do you get into the weeds that far? Well, you know, I'm not a nurse and obviously not a doctor. But what I do is, let's say I ask the family to let's compile a list. Let's go together to the GP, to the to the, the internist, the general practitioner, and say, all right, these are all the me- medications we're taking. Do we think this is correct? Is it not? Because a lot of times seniors are seeing lots of doctors, right. lots of specialists, and everybody's uh, prescribing different things. So that's one area when I when it comes to medication, we tr- I want to get it all on the same page. Because, literally. Yes, literally. Um, but no, I don't... You know, I don't get into counteracting medications and all that because that's not my specialty. And, right. and, and so, no. But I do get them connected with their pharmacist and or doctor, a nurse practitioner to to do that. To present this list of medications. Right. I've heard stories about elderly who are taking, I don't know, big handfuls of medicine every day. And no one was really clear on why they were taking some of these. They, I don't know. I didn't prescribe it. I don't know who would prescribe it. And it just was <laughs> just was on there. And it's. Mm-hmm. Once they began to be weaned off some of these medicines, their their outlook changed, their behavior changed. It was beneficial to become to to wean off of some of these things. And I think you're right. After some point, people have been going to the doctor for so long that they just continue to renew the medicine, whether they need it or not. Mm-hmm. Whether That's right. the yeah, and it kind of can be scary. I'm curious who refers you. Who is out there saying, oh, you need to call Ellen Douglas? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we as a family obviously would do so. But who else is out there in the in the community 
who knows of your skills, who is advocating for your services to their clients? Yeah, so word of mouth is obviously huge. Um, and you know, from previous families, like you mentioned. So attorneys, financial planners, priests, ministers, nurse other facilities in town, nursing homes. A lot of times I'll get a call from, say, a, an admission coordinator in a nursing home, and they've met with with a husband of someone who's about to be admitted, to, and they're, they're just very concerned. And so they say, you know, I, I prefer, I've referred you to this uh, gentleman, and I, he really needs some help. You know, his wife is going to get the help she needs, but he needs some help at home. Social workers at the hospital, discharge planners at the hospital, That's that's one area. But really, word of mouth is huge. What do you advise somebody who may be considering this? So let's say there's a young person out there that says, I'm, I have a, a, an instinct to care. I have an instinct to help. And mm-hmm. I'm trying to find the place that I can do it that it would mean the most. Describe what it takes to do your job. Maybe he or she is meant for it, and, and maybe they're not. So what does it take? Okay, so it takes a lot of patience. Um, you have to be, you know, working with seniors, just being methodical, um, patient, kind, um, being willing to listen um, and not rush through your visit or your time with them um, and making sure that you carve out a lot of time because it, it is it's very important they have a lot to say and they want to be heard so I, that's what that's what I would say for sure yeah and is there a special designation necessary to become a geriatric care yeah. manager so um so like I said earlier you know being a nurse or a social worker or something in the healthcare related field and then you do go through um, a process if you want to get certified um, through the Aging Life Care Association. There are some um, tests you can take or you take and then you have to keep up your continuing education credits as well. Yeah. Um, so that's how you kind of get to that point. Ellen Douglas, I will say this one more time and I want everybody to hear. We were in a crucial need at a state with my elderly mother and you came in and provided us clarity and comfort and it was something that I'm 53 years old. It seems that all of my buddies out there right now are dealing with aging issues with their parents. And to know that you're out there was so refreshing. And I can't thank you enough for the help you gave my family. 18. No, it was my mother passed away 16, six months ago, but I guess it was about 18 months maybe that you stepped into our house and gave us this clarity. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. It was my pleasure. Geriatric care manager. I'm sitting in the studio today with Ellen Douglas Alvis, and she is, she was very helpful to me. And I want you guys to remember the services that ladies like her, people like her offer. They're out there and you may need them. The listener of this show is probably in the same boat as I am with aging parents and I want you to know that she's out there. Ellen Douglas, someone's listening and wants to find you. How can they find you? Okay, so just give me a call. Um, You can call 251-767-1105, or you can email me at ellen at yourpremiercare.com. Yourpremiercare.com. Ellen at yourpremiercare.com. Very good. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you. I'll be back after this break with final comments. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Kim Marston, brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate at the Culver House College of Business at the University of Alabama. This is Bill Wasden, labor and employment attorney at Burr and Foreman. With offices across Alabama, our attorneys are keenly aware of employment situations in a state with under 3% unemployment. Employers have faced many obstacles over the last two years, and new processes and policies must be in place to ensure you're setting clear expectations for your employees. We've created a list of the top five legal and operating issues facing employers in 2022 that will, ultimately, ensure your company is prepared for a data breach, the great resignation, new presidential executive orders, or potential overtime rule changes. Reach out to me at bwasden at burr.com, that's B-U-R-R dot com, or my partner, Katie Willis, kwillis at burr.com, for this information. Burr attorneys are here to help you with your labor and employment law needs. No representation is made that the quality of the legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers. (laughs) 
Ellen Douglas says she's busy. My impression is that she's very busy. And first, she's an exceptional lady. And secondly, her skills and her knowledge, her expertise is in extraordinary demand. We are back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by the Alabama Center for Real Estate, housed in the Culver House College of Business, all housed in the University of Alabama. Uh, a geriatric care manager. Someone that is going to be able to help you make decisions in these very, very difficult end of life, towards the end of life, let's say, stages that close people go through. Or, you know, you may be one of these people that she talked to. You've moved to Alabama, yet your your parents and are, are elsewhere and you need, for whatever reason, you can't be there. You need somebody to keep an eye on them, help you make decisions about them. You start looking for geriatric care managers. And I, my impression is that, that they're out there, but there are not tons of them out there. So you got to do a pretty good search to find one. But when you do, the value that they offer is really remarkable. And you heard me say this. You're tired of hearing me say this, but it was one of the transformational moments towards my mother's end of life that helped my, my siblings and I, um, siblings and I kind of come to grips with what's going on with my mother and someone to guide us in there. Very valuable. Again, I'm going to say it one more time. A geriatric care manager based on our rapidly aging population, the fact that fewer children are being born today, the fact that those that are having children are generally having them later in life, meaning that when I was a young man and should have been taking care of my children, I had none. Now that I'm a middle-aged man, had children later in life, I am taking care of our young children at the same time my parents were and are. My father's 85, uh, aging, and he's great. But one of these days, we may need to rely on Ellen Douglas's expertise at, an, at another point. Anyway, remarkable to know that she's out there and stuff like that. Thank you very much, Ellen Douglas for your time in the studio today. Again, it took 18 months for me to twist her arm to get in the studio. And uh, when I finally did, obviously, well worth the effort. I'm happy to say that What's Working continues to grow. We're expanding into new markets. We're having conversations on new markets uh, uh, out there, trying to find new places for the show to grow. We're developing partnerships with publications that I think will be very valuable to the show. We may have already actually referenced that. I don't know. Um, so we're continuing to grow new markets, uh, partnerships with new stuff. It's all very exciting for us. And our goal, as always, is to be the premier, the go-to, the recognized radio source for workplace and marketplace trends and workforce trends in the state of Alabama. We want to be able to help my home state, perhaps your home state, grow and prosper in ways by providing information, content with expert guests that will hopefully stimulate us to do something different in our own world, our own business. You can find us online. CamMarston.com is my website. You can go to What'sWorkingCam.com where you'll find all uh, podcasts of the show. And there you can subscribe to the different podcasts. We have a presence on all the largest podcast sites. I encourage you to take a look there. And we try to remain relevant on social media, though it's increasingly hard with some of the social media platforms that just, I just don't feel like I fit there. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Cam Marston, or the Cam Marston in the numeral one. You can find me on Instagram in both of those ways as well. I really have a hard time seeing my content on TikTok. It just doesn't make sense for a guy like me to be next to all these dancing children. I don't know. Just doesn't feel right. But I'm there as well if you want to find me there. Again, cammarston.com or email me, cam at cammarston.com. show is produced by John Thompson with Ion Digital. We'll have another show next week. Have a good week, everybody.